Hmm? I love an origin story too. So that's where I love <laughs> that's right. That's right. all good stories. <laughs> let's, let's go straight, straight to the roots. Um, so my background, I'm from LA, I'm Middle Eastern. Uh, I went to film school at Chapman and there I studied film production. And Chapman was a particularly great experience because so much of it was almost like the process of eliminations of creativity to figure out what you're really good at and what you love. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, you write, you direct, you cinematography, editing, all of it. And I really liked the creative side of it, of writing and directing. But I found that as much endeavor as I had to put to make my thesis, which I was proud of, the producing side of it, which at that point is conversations and, yeah. hey, give me your car dealership and let a bunch of students come in and shoot for free. <laughs> and that, <laughs> that mentality, the, yeah. the conversationalist and connecting with people and really uh, overseeing a vision with something that felt very organic to me. Mm. So... On the heels of that feeling, I started interning at production companies. And from that, I drafted, I love corporate Hollywood, but I wanted a broader experience where material everywhere for every studio, for every client was relevant. Yeah. And I had um, a former agent teach a class at Chapman. His name was Harry Eflin. Uh, he was like very 70s, quintessential New York agent. And yeah. he was the one, I know, it was like very in the vibe. Yeah. Um, he was the one who pointed me toward the agency. So right after I graduated, I started in the mailroom at WME, uh, went through that kind of that ladder path, uh, became an assistant, then a coordinator, then a talent agent. And my relationship with Scott started there. Uh, he and I started working together, me as his agent and him as my, my client when I was at WME. And as we started to build content together in that fabric, it felt like Scott was right for a company. So it was quite serendipitous that Aaron Gilbert, who ran Braun, was in my office and I was expressing this to him. And I swear as easy as that conversation goes, was he well, I'll make that for you. Yeah. Um, so we built the company out with him. And at that point, I'd love to run it. So enter, <laughs> enter Matt Solar in the, the 2.0 version of my life. Oh, gosh, that's fantastic. <laughs> and I got to say, like, you know, going back to what you were talking about for Comic-Con, the vibe in the room, I've been to a <laughs> lot of panels. I've been to a lot of Comic-Cons. I don't know who the gentleman was who was kind of walking around the crowd, but he was getting us pumped like, I felt like we were getting ready for a Kid Cudi concert. And it was something where, you know, my daughter was reminding me, like, you know, every couple hours, like, hey, the panel's coming. The panel's coming. Like, we, you know, we can't, wow. like, we're not going to miss it. We're not going to miss it. And it, it was great. And just to meet you and hear your story and how Moon Man came about was just fantastic. But, uh, you know, most importantly, like I said, learning more about your story as well, coming up through the mailroom at William Morris, which I believe is the oldest, if not one of the oldest talent agencies yeah. <laughs> ever, um, is absolutely fantastic. I've been to every comic book store here in just North Carolina. I don't want to say all North Carolina, but at least yeah, in yeah. all of them sold out. Oh, that's the best. Completely, completely <laughs> sold out. Moon Man number one came out January 31st. How excited are you for this project? And what's what's the long-term goal for this is this going to be a limited series you're going to ride this till the wheels uh, fall off like you know of course fill the fans in because I, I you know i read this with my daughter we both got a copy being at the panel and then I, you know we both picked one up obviously when this came out and then i actually went back to my comic book store this week and i was like just out of curiosity do you have any moon man number ones left and they were like no done god <laughs> the, the, the second printing should be hitting stores okay. uh, any moment. I okay. think we're going to be getting into the third soon too, because a lot of a lot of the second was even pre-sold. So right. I'm very I'm very happy that you grabbed one that that yes, filled me, me with joy. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I I mean the the comic book I, I it's an immense amount. Like it really hits my heart so deep seeing it and seeing yeah. it real and seeing the reactions because it's something that. I mean, we, you know, we, we were talking about anime and manga. It's something that, and for Scott, who was such a longtime comic fan, it like right. it hit the kid spot. Like it was like, oh my God, you're doing the thing. There's something <laughs> about this that just felt so, you're holding it and you're reading the panels and even seeing the lettering and the, and it just is so real. It's mm -hmm. wild. Yeah. Um, 
but the genesis of Moon Man really started, it was a little bit reflective in Scott feeling like Black superheroes had either been exploited or you're the fourth character in Fantastic Four. And like, what is that? What does it mean to be a Black superhero? And the idea of creating this character of Moon Man, which was actually, you know, in his library first referenced in 2013 in his song so it's something he's been sitting with for a long time is like the counter to mr rager is moon man so it's mm -hmm. a character that he's he's had familiarity and played with um the idea of creating him as a true superhero and doing it as a comic book really came from it came from scott's feeling of what is what authentically or how authentically was i driven to see myself in characters as a kid and that was going to the comic book stores. So for him, it's a, it's a funny, it's a funny kind of start was that he went to comic book stores and the thing he fell in love with was Scud, the disposable assassin. And that's because he read Scud as Scott Mess Cuddy. And he was like, Oh, that one's, that one's me. So he was obsessed with that, with that comic. And the idea with Moon Man was, wouldn't it be so amazing if you put Moon Man on a comic book store in the same way that he found Scud a young kid could find Moon Man and have that aspirational sense of self and what what the possibilities could be for me. And for something that's so kind of personal and philosophical, not clear good versus evil, what is a hero in that format? What perspective are they supposed to take and what are they supposed to do? So those are all sort of the thematics and conversations we wanted to raise with Moon Man and really, you know, kind of focus in on first that local hero and that grounded uh, approach to who he is and what he can accomplish and what he's forced to deal with. And then that will obviously get bigger the more people who start to recognize that there is a hero, there is somebody with powers and who is he and what can he do? Yeah. Yeah. Love that. And I, I think that's definitely what I got just from the first uh, issue is the fact that it's not, you know, you don't have like your big bad there, but there yeah. is that corporate greed entity, which I think that we can all relate to. <laughs> so, you know, it's good to, you know, we always want somebody standing up for the rest of us, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, and I definitely get the uh, the Mr. Invincible kind of aspect to it as well, which I knew was one of his big inspirations to it. Yeah. So it's uh, it's great to see it come to life. Like I said, it was, it was great to hold it in my hand as the ash can version <laughs> of it, but to actually have it, uh, you know, issue number one, I'm incredibly uh, happy for it, and I, I can't wait for the rest of the world. If you do not have this comic book yet, wait. <laughs> you said issue two is coming out, and then or not issue two, but the second version uh, and the third. Second thing. <laughs> the second thing. That's right. So, in terms of Mad Solar, we got Maxine, the third yeah. movie coming out in the Timeless yeah. trilogy. Yeah. So, a, a couple questions here. I, you know, I've seen Pearl Scene X. Absolutely loved it. What, was this originally planned as a trilogy and how did the, you know, kind of collaboration come with Ty West? Yeah. So th it's a, it's a really, this is a really cool story and all credit goes to Ty okay. and then to me, a goth also joining in the, in the writing yeah. of Pearl for building this out and architecting it this way. Our involvement was actually wildly organic. Um, at the outset of creating Mad Solar, my Stuart gets a lot of credit. My husband represents Sam Levinson. Mm -hmm. uh, we got to know him. Scott ended up executive producing Malcolm and Marie, so they had built a relationship. And we're, you know, it's family, so we're that kind of component of a team that was involved in the X now franchise was already aware of us and interested as X was being built out. Um, Scott and Ty West were longtime friends because Scott had loved House of the Devil and had taken Ty out to dinner. So as Ty was creating X, he was thinking of Scott. Yeah. And again, outside of company, I'd spoken to A24, who I knew well from my time at WME, about who we are and what we want to do. And as I was expressing our love of horror, Scott, I will say, it's like there's a few subjects that he just like encyclopedic and <laughs> is one of them uh -huh. to the extent that when I was at WME, the only person he ever asked me to meet the entire time that we worked together was Sam Raimi. He's like, that's, that's it. That's the one. That's wow. the guy. <laughs> yeah. We can do no better. Um, and no other. Uh, so, so in expressing that to A24 it was like a very interesting moment because they were about to get the script for X and all three parties that were already involved in the project just thought, you know, Scott and Matt Solar and, and can right. we bring them to this? So the point that we came on to X was when the first script had come in. It was it was incredible. It was finished. I mean, Ty is truly a genius. Yeah. Uh, they went to shoot in New Zealand and it was right at the right as COVID was going on. 
And they had the two week quarantine before they could film. And as they were in quarantine, Ty and Mia put together the concept for Pearl. Go back to A24 and they're like, you've already flown us out here. We've got the set that we're building for X, the house, which would be the main set for Pearl. Why don't we just do both films back to back? And to A24's credit, they said yes. Now, this is epic. Wow. So the trilogy really built out of quarantine, which is kind of wild to think about. So it and it became Ty, who's a filmmaker who I feel like one of his biggest strengths, obviously the genre is something that he has such an affinity for, but his ability to play with time period and make it feel so nostalgic. So you're watching Pearl and you're like, this is Wizard of Oz. Like I, I feel, I feel this is taking me back to old Hollywood films that I've seen, but then you're slashing somebody with an ax and it's like, oh my God, <laughs> combining those two things is so outrageously cool and fun to live yeah. inside of. Same as the seventies. I'm like, man, remember when like Scorsese and this and that, we're all putting out movies at the same time. Now I'm like, okay, now I've got this seventies vibe. Yeah. And you know, it's like, she's got blood all over her face. It's that I think Ty is, is a genius with, he's a total genius with it. And Maxine too will play in a new time period. It'll play with kind of a new, a new architecture in that sense and just continue to expand out what he does so well. And what Mia does so well at the center of it. Oh, so she's, crazy. she's great. Yeah. She's great. So is there, is there a release date yet for Maxine? You know what? That's a great question. <laughs> And and uh, if I'm not mistaken, this one's going to be set in the '80s, right? So it's not long after. I don't know yet. Uh, 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 it takes in the '80s, exactly. Yeah. Love exactly. it. Exactly. So you're back to dealing with Maxine post all of the events of X and where she's at and what she's doing. Oh goodness! Can Still I... wanting to be a star. I'm a star. <laughs> <laughs> So you got the comic book out, you got magazine coming up. What what's next for you and what's next for Mad Solar? It's it's uh, a lot actually. It's really it's really very exciting. I would say that Mad Solar and not to say this was something that we sought to do in the creation of the company, but it happened pretty organically out of Scott's interest. We brought in pretty wide and horizontal in the verticals that we're interested in. So mm -hmm. Kind of as an example, you have Scott as an artist who came from music and then gets into film and TV and then, you know, calls one day and he wants to write a memoir, calls another day and he wants to do a fashion line. And, right. you know, King is organic. The comic book comes out of like another sort of yeah. sort of pillar of his. And I think Matt Solar then that became our specialty was this idea of partnering with artists. We're very culture facing because that's who yeah. that's who Scott is. He's he's, you know. You couldn't help but to say that he was in a constant dialogue with the kids and is very you know, true to his form. But taking these artists who speak to culture and creating content across mediums, so whatever ends up being most, most organic to what they want to do. So some of the things that we're doing kind of follow the gambit. There's more in the comic book space that we, that we want to do alongside Kyle. So that's going to be a component of all of it. There's... Um, there's a, a Fortnite experience that we're working on with a young artist. So that'll be our foray into gaming. Okay. There's a film we set up at Sony, which is also with Sam Levinson and the Lucas Brothers that hopefully we're going to push through alongside a series we have at Netflix, uh, which James Samuel will direct and Ian Edelman is show running. So that's like the wow. film, the TV. And then another thing that's really, really uh, really kind of stellar exciting that we're very proud of that we're doing is that we're working with this artist Jaron Braxton on his feature directorial debut which is like a very adult facing sonically driven monster movie that essentially we're hoping to sort of almost embrace the way that animation is done in Asia and Europe where yeah. it's auteur based that at a price rather than living through a studio system which treats it as and we experience this on intergalactic just takes a long time a lot of people a lot of money to, to put it together so essentially the the indie structure of building out animation in, in a U.S. format is what we're working on with this with this artist which is like insanely exciting <laughs> before we wrap up we do have some Personal, well, not personal. Some fan questions for you. I want to get to know your pop culture thing. Going to do a little little jingle here. So you know, these are questions from the fan. Sure. I know, I love this little song here. 
I'm like, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we got some questions from the fans. Uh, would like to know a little bit more just about like your taste, your interest, this, that, and the other. Yeah. So the first one is what is your favorite like go-to movie or go-to album? Like whenever you're feeling down and you just need like just a, like a little pick me up. Yeah. Um, you see, you're gonna, you're gonna laugh. It's very antithetical to Scott. I, I don't, I'm not one who goes down very often, if that makes sense. I, and I think that's come for me. It's, there was like a, I have a really, really, really close knit family. And there was a point for me that I realized, oh man, if I just have my family, then everything else is okay. And it, and it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. So it's a, it's a hard question to answer in that sense, but I will say, you know, whenever I want to be, and it's going to sound so like, uh, you know, whatever, but it, it's going to seem, <laughs> you know, but I, I'll like, lately I've been li- listening to a lot of Tchaikovsky. I've been going through his okay. symphony and you were talking about songs that you can remember when, and yeah. I remember distinctly my best friend in college playing one of his symphonies for me. And I'd been looking for it for a long time. And it turns out it was the intro to symphony number three. And I just like, you know, I don't know, it would like park in this like, raucous celebration uplift in me so right now i'm a i'm a symphony girl when i need okay, okay. <laughs> I I need like my it. my boost <laughs> i like it i i, um, I, I like listen to classical when i'm working when i need yeah. a zone so i like that that's the that's a different kind of answer and that's good yeah. It's liberating. Yeah. Yeah. And also on the content side, it's like going back to our mutual love, which is the anime. There that's, you go. That's yeah, right. That's, that's right. right. You can always go back to <laughs> take, an anime. Take any <laughs> happy place. Love it. Love it. All right. This one's a serious one here. Question number two. <laughs> who is your favorite Ninja Turtle? You don't even have to say why, but who is your favorite Ninja Turtle? Because I really believe that everybody has at least one yeah. Ninja Turtle. Yeah. So you took me straight, like this takes me straight to being a kid again. Um, I, I was like trying to remember, I'm like, who did I really love when I was a kid? And I think I loved Michelangelo. Check out the cute eyes. I think he was my favorite. I know it's like, it's every time that I re-experience Ninja Turtles, it gives me like a whole holistic sense of nostalgia, but then something about Michelangelo just like, oh, I think you were always my guy. So uh, that's my answer. <laughs> I mean, the nunchucks, the fact that he was like more the kid than the rest of them. Yeah. Uh, even going back to the tubular and all those days, but even yeah. in, the, in like the newer versions of it, like he just seems the most relatable. You know, Leonardo's serious. He's the leader. Yeah. yeah. Donatello, yeah. you know, he does appeal to a, a lot of us nerds out there. Yeah. And Ralph was, the, you know, the tough guy. The tough so, guy. But, you yeah. know, like Michelangelo yeah. was always a great blend of just all three of them. Yeah, so, he's a fun dude. Excellent, excellent, <laughs> excellent. There's, there's no wrong answer to it, but I got I to gotta give you the air horns for that one. 